Congratulations, Ellen. Thank you. What was it like to, to get the news and win such a prestigious award? Uh, well, honestly, I was in the middle of training and competing, um, getting my team ready to go to World Championships. So I was actually up at Canadian Henley. We had just finished. We won Canadian Henley, but we had to come back home and train. Got a phone call on the way home, and I was very overwhelmed and flattered, but I said, I can't really think about this now. I, I want to focus on Worlds, and, and uh, so I, I did put it aside and just focus on the world, but when we when we came back and the news kind of came out, it was really exciting because there are so many people back home at CRI that are also a huge part of the reason why uh, why I'm receiving this award. And so when I got back home, it was uh, it was fun to enjoy it and have all different people come up and say congratulations and and enjoy that uh, after coming back from the World Championships. Tell me a little bit about. Your career as a rower in the national team was a, as an able-bodied rower. Most of the coaching you did before you started at CRI was able-bodied rowers. So, mm -hmm. how did you get involved in adaptive rowing, and sure. what is it about adaptive rowing that was so attractive to you? Well, honestly, it sort of found me. I I started coaching at CRI right out of college when I graduated Villanova, and at that point. CRI was a handful of people um, trying to make the national team who were coaching on the side to make a little extra money. And there was only, you know, a few dozen members at the time. We didn't have much of anything except this amazing coaching talent around me, this amazing foundation that CRI was built on, which was Rowing for All. So back then they did actually have adaptive rowing, and I started picking up some of those sessions. But I never thought it would make, uh, it would become anything of a career for me. Um, I went on to make the national team and follow my own competitive dreams and tried um, college coaching for a while. And it was when I came back to Boston and took over the outreach department at Community Rowing, I started to realize how much rowing meant to me uh, as an athlete. And I wanted to bring that to as many people as possible. And at that point, para rowing was just a part of it. We were trying to bring uh, rowing into inner city school systems. We were trying to serve military uh, veterans. We were really just trying to reach as many people as possible as who, who could benefit. And, you know, people with disabilities just happened to be part of that mission. Uh, when Bruce said, hey, I think we should try and host the selection camp for the LTA4, my first reaction was like, how are we going to do that? We're we doing so much here. I don't know um, if this is the right thing. And he really encouraged it. So I knew for sure that we needed to be competitive. When I, uh, any program that I've taken over, um, we don't want to be competitive for the sake of being cutthroat and uh, win at all costs, but the element of competition is so powerful for everyone. The ability to train and have that goal and have that urgency to be as good as you can be on race day, that's a really powerful thing that everyone needs and everyone benefits from. So when I took over the GRO program, which used to be fairly recreational, I said, look, we're going to do all these great things, but we're going to be competent, we're going to be good, and we're going to do everything that we can to be as professional and competent as we possibly can. We may not uh, win the state championship, but we can, we can load our equipment the way champions do. We can put the oars down like champions do. We can do all these things that champions do, and little by little, we'll, we'll, start to, we'll start to feel like champions and possibly become champions. And that's really what we, we did with... Uh, all the programs and the, the LTA4, we try to be as competitive as possible in the first round of selection camp. You know, I, I was realizing that many of the athletes had come to rowing after their disability without that background and that foundation of having a competitive high school experience or a competitive collegiate experience and that really, um, really could see that that was holding us back at the international scene. and. Uh, through nothing but luck and the uh, great uh, willingness of other coaches, the next year around we had a selection camp that had some very competitive athletes who were just earning their seats on open high school and collegiate teams, and that was the game changer. It wasn't really anything we did differently to the training or the rigging or anything, but we finally had athletes, about 50% of that camp this year, maybe that year, maybe even more, were athletes from a collegiate or a high school system, and that's why they were good, and that was the thing that sort of launched us forward up in the medal stands. But when you started coaching, you realized what rowing meant to you. What, what did rowing mean to you? 
Well, rowing for me was an outlet for my competitive nature. I ran track and played basketball in high school, but was nowhere near good enough to be recruited at Villanova University for those sports. So I walked on to rowing and I grew up on the on a little lake in the summers in New Hampshire and always drawn to rowing uh, just in you know the rowboats with my dad. So when I found rowing on the school with Villanova, I knew I was hooked. I joined with a bunch of friends and uh, some stayed with it and some didn't. But, but for me, it was um, very difficult and I liked that. It was that sort of fascination with what's difficult. I want to master this. This is challenging and frustrating and I want to get better at it. And uh, I had good coaches along the way and had a reasonable, successful career at Villanova. I won a few medals at Dadvale. And um, I don't think I really knew what it meant to me until after college, though. I thought I was done with rowing, um, but realized that uh, uh, I wanted to kind of give a little bit back to the sport. And knowing that rowing was not really present in my hometown of Lawrence, Massachusetts, I thought, well, let's, you know, push something forward there and, and make that opportunity because there's not a lot of kids from Lawrence that. Uh, get to go to Villanova and row on a college rowing team and uh, fall into a group that I did at Community Rowing uh, where all the coaches were just coaching on the side and training for the national team. I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. This is for me. And uh, How do you bring that now to this group of, of young athletes that, that you're coaching? I mean, how, how do you translate that to them? Well, they already have it for themselves. You know, these like I said, these kids uh, showed up at selection camp uh, ready to race, and they had that competitive edge. And for me, uh, coaching at that national team is just bringing them together and knowing how young they are, giving them all of my experience and, and mental prepara preparation that I had, remembering my first time on the national team, my first international race, how to manage those nerves. I just tried to give them as much of my uh, learned wisdom, I guess, to, to make sure that they were ready, because a very young crew, uh, average age 19 their first year on the national team, and that's very, very young. Um, the power world in general, the broad power rowing world, where is it now and where do you see it going? Uh, this is probably the most exciting time to be part of power rowing right now. I feel fortunate to have fallen into it at the time that I did, because I was able to look at it with the curiosity of a stranger. Why do we only row a thousand meters? Why do these boats have to weigh so much? Why do we only have these four or five different boat classes when we've got a, you know, thousands of other people with differing abilities that don't quite match up here? Shouldn't we do something for them? So because I was distant from it, I could ask those questions. And we are at a time right now that FISA is considering uh, broadening the distance for international races from 1,000 to 2,000, and that is tremendously powerful. And I say that not because of how long they should race, but it puts us on equal terms with everyone else. Our sport crowns its world champions over 2,000 meters, and we want to be there with the rest of the senior team, and that's where I think it's going to go. It's also going to change uh, the boat weights. You know, if the boat weighed 22 kilos less, wouldn't you want to race in that kind of boat? So. This is the elite scene. There are many people who will benefit from the broader, wider, heavier boats, and there's no nothing wrong with that. We probably all started in a recreational type of shell, but for the elite athlete trying to win a Paralympic medal, they deserve the top of the line equipment, and it's safe and effective, and they can row it. They should be able to row it. You must be excited to be part of it. Oh yeah, it's crazy. It's it's amazing because at CRI we're like this giant think tank, and. Um, the banner is rowing for all and I think like we stretch that banner like every which way we can and CRI has really trusted me and said you know I said to my athletes you know I brought them to a speed order Curtis let us uh, have a para entry in last fall speed order and um, I looked at the boats we were in and I never saw it. the speed orders are all singles so you don't notice it so much with the team boats around but the broad, the wide singles I was suddenly embarrassed I thought this is it. I am never putting my athletes out in these things again. If they can row something smaller, they will. And so from that day forward, we said to my athletes, we're going to go out in the racing single. But what if we flip? I'm like, I don't know. What if you flip? I'll be here and pick you up. Come on. We have to try this. We have to figure this out. And that's what's exciting about CRI because we have that ability to 
push the envelope and demonstrate some things. And some of the photos and the race clips that we've sent to FISA have helped people feel a little bit more comfortable about thinking about reducing that um, equipment restriction on the para-athletes.